Well, we're going to return to talking about game theory. And today we're going to get to some games that get people excited, especially in the social sciences, uh, because it looks like these are games that have a lot of applications. Now, it's not as if the ones we've looked at aren't like coordination games are really important. We're going to come back to those. But we're also going to consider some other games. Here is one way of thinking about a set of problems that leads you directly to a certain issue in game theory. It was, I guess, in the 1950s and 1960s, people began to talk about the tragedy of the commons. Now, sometimes this idea is focused on specific environmental concerns. Sometimes it's meant to be an argument against public goods and in favor of private ownership. Sometimes it's used as an argument in favor of government regulation of things that seem inevitably to be public goods, like air and water. And in fact, it was part of this sort of thinking that led to the Clean Air Act, the Water Act, and things like that. In any event, here's the idea. Suppose you have a few sheep grazing in a pasture. It's full of the carrying capacity of the land. Everything's good. And the various farmers in the area think, yeah, this pasture is just there. Um, nobody in particular owns it. And so it's great if I can graze my sheep on this land. And so they do that. And as more sheep begin to graze on land, at first that's fine, still within the carrying capacity, it's all good. Each farmer thinks, well, if I expand my flock, and, and since there, there won't be any room for them on my land, I can graze in this common land, everybody has an incentive to actually add more sheep to the commons area. But eventually, there are too many sheep, and they end up eating all the grass. <laughs> okay? Uh, and so all of a sudden, wait, everybody's worse off because now that common area that used to be a nice pasture has been ruined and nothing's growing there. There are all sorts of settings where this sort of thing happens. The college I went to had an area, a very beautiful area, between some of the buildings and the dormitories that was all grassy fields. It was a very nice area with some big trees. And there were a few walkways. But people often cut across this, and right, and it makes sense, I mean, to walk across the grass when you realize, wait, I have to go from here to here, I don't want to walk all that way and to that, and that way, and maybe you're late to class or whatever it is. So, you don't say on the sidewalk, you walk across, and it was worse because some of these people had dogs, and the dogs were terrible, and so on. But anyway, okay, that goes on, and a certain amount of that is fine, right? You walk across the grass, well, the grass doesn't die because you walk across it. But if enough people do it, the grass does start dying. And then what happened on our campus, every March, it would just rain. Okay, March was the rainy month there. And so all of us would turn into a sea of mud. And it was disgusting, <laughs> okay? And we suddenly said, ah, oh, we're all worse off. If only we had kept the sidewalks. But of course, by then it was too late. It looked like we were doing no harm until basically the traffic got over the carrying capacity of the lawn and and something similar like that happens here. Well, these sorts of tragedies of the commons can happen all over the place. What are some other examples of tragedies of the commons? Where each of us, basically, is in a situation where we have some incentive to do something. It looks like we gain a benefit. There's no significant or noticeable harm to anyone else. But if we all do that, the harm does become noticeable. And then we're all worse off. Yeah? So this isn't like necessarily like a good way to start, but like, in a way like stealing, like getting something like for your benefit, but then like, that means they have to like cut wages, like for workers, they have to like wave people off into the long run just because they can't afford um, to support everyone in government stealing. Okay, good, good. Stealing can look like this. Now, if, if you steal from some particular person, it's easy to see you know, like, the effect and the harm, but especially this is true if you steal from a company, let's say you, uh, I don't know, you work somewhere and you just take some supplies home, right? You just take pencils or paper or whatever it is there. Or maybe, you know, you're, you're a shoplifter in a store. You think, oh, it's a big company. They'll never notice that I take this thing or that thing. But this adds up, right? You think, I'll be better off with this thing. They'll never notice a loss. But actually, people start doing that, and all of a sudden, the losses add up. And then they have to install security cameras and have security systems and so forth and so on. And things are worse than if everybody had been obeyed the rules from the beginning. 
Yeah, if you build like a common garden where everybody plants and takes, but nobody plants anything for them. Good, you have a common community garden. And at first, there's some noble, enterprising person who plants a lot of things in there, and then it's like, come and take the vegetables. All you have to do is help do your part, contribute <laughs> the weeding and so on, but nobody makes you do this, right? So what happens to this community garden? Well, yeah, nobody really takes care of it. People move in and uh, you know, take the fruit, but they don't actually contribute, and so the conditions are thing that's worse and worse. Yeah, let's say like a really bad diesel car and has like no catalytic converter and it just emits all this gross stuff into the atmosphere. If you're the only one driving a car, it doesn't matter. But right. Matter okay, good. You have a car. It's polluting a lot. It might be look, your pollution in the entire state of Texas is not significant. <laughs> but if a bunch of people are driving cars like that, the effect is significant. Which is actually part of the reason that some areas of the country have much more restrictive regulations than others. If you're driving some polluting car in the middle of Montana, well, maybe there really is no harm because that's pretty insignificant in an area where there are very few people and very few cars. But if you're in Los Angeles, there are a lot of people doing similar things and it adds up fast. Um, other examples, yeah. Norms of decent and lawful behavior. If there's like one guy who's just being uh, a dick on the highway, <laughs> then it doesn't make that big of a difference, but if enough people do it, then it just destroys the fabric of uh, decency. Good, yeah, just norms of decent behavior, right? One person breaks the norm for whatever reason they think they benefit as a result of doing that, and often they do. Maybe they become famous as the norm breaker, right? <laughs> um, or they become a cultural icon or whatever. It, you know, it helps them. And you think, well, what does my doing this have? You know, how does that have an effect on me? But actually, it does, right? If enough people start doing that, then all of a sudden, it changes things in such a way that everybody can end up worse off. So it might be something like the shoplifting case as a particular example of that, where, hey, we were all respecting one another's property, but then it starts breaking down. In a way, the broken windows theory of policing is dependent on this idea. Once you allow certain norms to break down, you allow buildings in the neighborhood with broken windows or Un uncut grass or whatever, the whole place starts looking like, oh, nobody cares what happens here. And the entire nature, you might say, of social exchanges change. So one person does it, one person hops the subway turnstile or lets their grass grow, or whatever, who cares? But if enough people start doing it, it's like, wait, everybody's worse on it. Okay. Um, there might, I mean, cheating in college would be like this, right? One person cheats, you think, well, hey, I benefited, who's really the harm? But if enough people start cheating, then it's very disturbing. A recent survey of students, actually, not here, but nationally, found that 70% cheated at some point in college. 70%. So it's not just like, oh, well, I'm the only one doing it, you know. <laughs> it's like a lot of people start doing it, and all of a sudden, it's, it has a larger effect where people think, oh, maybe create so many more things. All of these exhibit a kind of structure that in game theory is known as the prisoner's dilemma. It was A.W. Tucker who first came up with this particular example. It isn't in the 1944 book by von Neumann and Morgenstern, but it is a kind of scenario that is actually really helpful to think about. So, what is the prisoner's dilemma? Well, it's the kind of scenario, here just conceived of as had two players, but we've been talking about situations in which there are many, many players with environmental issues or questions of social norms or ethical behavior and so on. Um, but the key idea is this. We've got two people, and in this scenario that Tucker lays out, it's very simple. These two people are held by the police for question. They're taken into separate the police have enough evidence to convict them on some small charge. However, they are pretty confident that these people have committed a much more serious crime. And so they take each one into separate rooms and they say to each one, listen, if you confess and implicate the other person, we'll just give you a slap on the wrist because we've got enough evidence to convict you on this small thing. But we're going to go easy on in fact, maybe we just let you walk with me. If, on the other hand, <laughs> you don't say anything and we're able to convict you on a major charge, you're facing serious prison time. 
And so here's the, the idea. You start thinking, well, okay, I don't know what my colleague in that other room is doing. Suppose he's talking, right? He's implicating me. I want to have a book thrown <laughs> on this really serious charge. Well, he gets off easy if I don't talk. If he's confessing, I better confess. I'll be better off. Then at least I'll get credit. Maybe we'll be convicted of a more serious charge, but we'll both get credit for cooperating with the police. But then I think, well, what if he's staying silent? Look, if he's staying silent, neither of us implicates the other, they still have enough evidence to convict us on this lighter charge. So I'm still going to jail. On the other hand, if he's not confessing, and I point the finger at him, he goes to jail for a long time, and I've been off so free. So I think, huh. So in other words, if he's confessing, I'm better off confessing too. And if he's not confessing, I'm still better off confessing. So no matter what's going on, I'm better off confessing. So you talk, right, and you confess. The guy in the other room is thinking about it the same way. <laughs> so he confesses. And so what happens? You both implicate each other on the more serious charge. You both get some credit for actually cooperating with the police, so it's not as bad as it could have been. But still, there was a much better scenario. Just shut up, stay silent. You'll both be convicted on the lighter charge, but that's way better than being convicted on the more serious one. Now, here is the sort of abstract way of thinking about this. We can put utilities in there, and often people represent this with cardinal numbers, years in prison, and things like that. But I want to understand the general structure of the situation. So I've described it here in terms of ordinal numbers to make it easier, I think, to grasp what's really generating the issue. We've got two people, A and B, who are separated and unable to talk to one another unable to form any real agreement that's enforceable between them. And we think, okay, suppose the other person is remaining silent. They're not confessing to the police. Well, if I remain silent too, we're still both going to go to jail in this minor charge. And so that's my second best choice, to be you know, convicted of a minor thing. My best choice is actually if I talk and that person remains silent, then I go free, so I get my first choice. And, of course, it's really bad for that guy. He gets his last choice, but hey, that's his problem. And so I think, yeah, I'm better off talking. What happens if the other person's talking? Well, if I stay silent, I'm in real trouble. That's my worst case scenario. If we both talk, well, at least we get credit for cooperating with the police. I still get convicted on a more serious thing, but I get a lighter sentence. So, I think I'm better off doing that. So I talk. But now my uh, colleague in the other room thinks about it exactly the same way. And so he thinks, yeah, if this guy's remaining silent, I'm better off talking. If he's talking, I'm better off talking. So the two of them end up talking. But they'd have been much better off getting their second choice instead of their third choice if they had remained silent. Now, you might think, yeah, that's a really interesting sort of scenario. You might think, as Ariel Rubenstein did in his review of von Neumann and Morgenstern's book, look, this is just making the obvious point that sometimes when people behave selfishly, <laughs> that doesn't work out so well. Okay. Uh, and yeah, in a way, it's an obvious point, but actually, you can manipulate this scenario so that it isn't each person just thinking selfishly about only their welfare. You can set it up so that the numbers work out, so that this is actually what happens even if both of them are thinking about their joint welfare. Still, you can say, oh yeah, and in fact, a lot of pollution type scenarios look like, they look like, yeah, well, wait a minute, um, it's gonna be costly to clean up the environmental problem, so actually maybe we're better off doing this, but as a result of everybody doing it, and making the same judgment given the behavior of the others, it turns out that even if everybody's altruistic, you're up in the same scenario. So it isn't just a point about selfishness. It's about the fact that what you do, what makes what it makes good sense, ethically or selfish, for you to do, given that other people's behavior is out of your control, is different from what it is if you all join me together. Okay, so let's use the terms we've been developing in game theory to analyze this. I'm 
got to think about it from A's point of view. Clearly, if B is remaining silent, well, if I move from silence to talking, I'm going from my second choice to my first choice scenario. So I have an incentive to go from this square to this square. I'm going to be better off. <clears throat> Similarly here, if, I'm, if that person's talking, I can improve my situation by talking too. So notice the arrows go in the same direction. Both of them say, look, if I'm thinking about remaining silent, no matter what he's doing, I'm going to end up better off by talking. But of course, then we can think about this <laughs> from the other person's point of view too. Before we get to that, though, notice that this means that talking is my dominant strategy. I'm better off talking, no matter what the other person's doing. If they're talking, I'm better off talking. If they're staying silent, I'm better off talking. So talking is my dominant strategy. It is the best thing for me to do, no matter what the other person does. But of course, that other person then thinks about it and says, well, ha, yeah, if that guy, if A is remaining silent, I am better off talking. I go from second to first choice. If A is talking, I go from fourth to third choice. And so the arrows both go in this direction. For B, I'm better off talking no matter what. That's to say that talking is B's dominant strategy as well. B is better off talking no matter what it does. And often people in thinking about games think, play your dominant strategy. If there, if there is one, if there's something you can do that makes you better off, no matter what the other players do, do it. Right? It seems entirely rational. However, look what happens. Both players play the dominant strategy, and here's the natural equilibrium of results. They both end up with their third choice, going to jail for the more serious charge. They could have been there. They would have been better off. So both end up talking, the police end up happening. Now, various students of mine who have had criminal past have told me, yeah, this is the way it works. <laughs> this is what the police do, and this is usually what happens. People confess because they're given this line of argument by the police if they aren't clever enough to think of it themselves, and they realize, oh crap, I'm better off confessing. So they do, so people end up getting a lot more trouble than they might otherwise have gotten into. Now, to some extent, I mean, you might have learned this in elementary school. We mentioned this once before. You're always better off not confessing. The teacher says, all right, who put the tactic on the seat? Or who threw the chalk at the blackboard while I was looking away? And, you know, not the talk. <laughs> Even if she says the class is going to do an extra assignment or something, you know, still it's better than the alternative. Uh, so in a way, it is an obvious point. But still, think about the dynamic of this. You can think, oh, look, this is set up in such a way that I'm kind of talking. Now, part of the reason it works in a classroom and it doesn't work in this scenario is in a classroom you can see the other students. Right? You see if somebody else confesses. But here, you're in a room in isolation. It would be very different if the two pro prisoners are at the same table and can see what the others do. Um, and so that's the teacher's flaw. They need to take people into a room and question them all separately. But in any event, this does mean people can easily end up in a worse scenario. They end up here instead of here, which would clearly be better for both of them. Yeah? How would you account for the Maximum best stitches get stitches. This. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so okay. That's yes. only your best outcome if you get out early, but everyone knows that you that you stitch. Good, good, good. Okay, okay. yes. So exactly. Um, suppose you are part of a criminal organization, <laughs> and you don't want to have this happen to your people. You want to stymie the police. What do you do? This is actually a really important question because prisoner dilemmas in general are. <laughs> okay, they're not only bad for the people involved, they're usually bad for society as well. Now, not necessarily. It might be a kind of cooperation we really want to discourage. We want to put potential price fixers or colluders, colluders or criminal gangs, etc., into prison dilemmas. But ordinarily, this is a bad thing to be, right? Because you each act rationally, or in some situations, you can even act altruistically, and you end up with a worse scenario. So, how do you avoid it? Now, suppose you are the crime boss, and you're in this situation, what do you do? Well, 
Uh, I believe that like there's a pre, uh, exposed incentives that you have to have. So say you rob a bank, but you hit the money, but you got a coffee in it. Neither one of you gonna talk because you both smell that. We can go get the money later. But if you get caught with the money, then one of you probably gonna talk, you know, and say it was him or it was his idea. Same thing with like the violence. Like beforehand, you know, like, hey, if we get caught, you can't say anything because we're gonna like kill you or like your family or hurt you or something. Yeah. There's none of that at the beginning. You don't even like talk about that. And when you get talked, and you have more incentive to talk, because hey, I could get out, and there's no consequences to that. You know? Exactly right. So actually, both of those are really important, and people notice the one, but they often fail to notice, notice the other. So that's a great point. Um, the most obvious thing I like to do as the head of the criminal gang is to say, look, you're going to be punished if you talk. <laughs> In other words, I'm trying to change your matrices here and say. Uh, yeah, the other guy remained silent, and you talked and indicated you're a snitch. We're going to rub you up. Hey, you want to meet Vinny later? You know, don't meet Vinny. <laughs> so that's the sort of thing you might think, all right, yeah, that I, I want to make that no longer your first choice scenario, because you realize even if immediately I'm better off down the line, I'm worse off. But now, the other dimension of this is also really interesting. It is different if the people are caught with the money and if they're caught but have hidden the money. Because after all, if they've already been caught with the money, they don't gain right, by actually hiding evidence of the crime. But suppose there is the cash at the end. They, they robbed the bank and they got away with $200,000 and they managed to stack it. At least don't know where it is. Well then, whoever talks is going to have to spill the beans on where the money is. That means they don't get that paid off from it out. So, in short, it might be that this is no longer the first choice scenario, and this is no longer third, because there's a punishment attached to talking. Or it might be because there's a big benefit to remaining silent. Yeah, you go to jail for five years, but when you get out, you're rich. Okay? And in that case, you think, oh, wait, this is a lot better than my second choice. Actually, maybe I'd rather go to jail for five years and come out rich than go to jail for two years and come out poor, <laughs> right? I think about the amount, and if it's not much waiting for me, I might say, oh, yeah, I'd be better off actually getting a job. But if it's enough money, I think, yeah, three years for a big payoff when I get out, maybe that's worth it. So those are both ways of changing these matrices and saying, yeah, this is all short-term thinking, but longer term, hey, talking is going to lead to a serious consequence for you, a negative consequence, and remaining silent, ooh, that might lead to a big payoff, so lead to a benefit. Even if it's not a question of like having hidden the money, maybe you rise in the organization, you're somebody that the capo de tutti capi can trust because you actually went to prison and saved some. Yeah, you took the rap, way to go down. I trust you. That can be important. <laughs> but, my accents are terrible. So that's <laughs> how you it's not that I'm trying hard and failing. I'm not really trying. Uh, well, actually, what can I say? I'm imitating the Simpsons and Pig Godfather or something like that. <laughs> now, <clears throat> okay, so they could clearly do better by cooperating. If we want to change this around, the most obvious thing to do is to basically give them a benefit by cooperating here. <laughs> uh, I suppose the issue is not cooperating with the police, but cooperating with one another and staying silent, or, you know, punished for defecting, defecting from the gang in this case, and talking to the police. Um, however, there are other ways of doing it. So, for example, it matters whether you and I are strangers or whether we know each other and we are doing this all the time. Suppose we're strangers, we just both have be in the bank at the same time, trying to rob the safe. And you're drilling in from that side, I'm drilling in from this side. We meet in the safe and we say, well, I didn't expect to see you here, but hey, let's split it evenly. <laughs> okay, but I don't know who you are, and I never expect to encounter you again. <clears throat> it's very different from if we have repeated interactions. You and I are robbing these banks all the time. You know, we're like Bush Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. And so we're kind of in this together, and I know if you Rat me out, there goes our partnership. If I rat you out, likewise. And so the continued interactions here are going to change this. So next week we're going to talk about iterated prison solvents. 
where we find ourselves in this situation. And it does seem to change the nature of the interactions. All right, so let's talk about real-world examples of this. You might be sitting there thinking, well, listen, I'm not in charge of air pollution in Texas, nor am I somebody who's involved in a criminal gang, so how does any of this help me? <laughs> um, it would be interesting to teach a course on the philosophy of crime, but since I hope most of you don't have first-hand need of that information, um, what are some other cases where you face something like a prisoner's dilemma? Yeah. Oh, well, I know a lot of criminals, unfortunately, so this has happened recently to some people that I knew. They were like thousands and thousands of drugs, and then they got caught. And then, like, they started telling on each other. One guy told on his mom and said that she gave him the money to, like, an idea to do it, stuff like that, you know. Oh, no benefit or consequences. Okay. <clears throat> well, good point. There are lots of situations where you might be in a position to know something that would get somebody else in trouble, right? Even if it's your own mother. Uh, and you might think, gosh, this goes back to Confucius's example. If you see your father stealing a sheep, you know, would you turn it in? Uh, and we were talking about sheep and pastures. This is all forming your grand kind of unity. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, suppose you think, wait, yeah, look, I have information here that could get people in trouble. Maybe you're part of a drug gang. Or Gosh, maybe you work in our admissions office. Etc., <laughs> <laughs> uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. I mean, you might be part of it. You, you might be aware, right? Whether you're directly involved, you might be aware of this criminal behavior. And now the question is well, should I talk about that? You know, I, I may get in trouble if I talk about this. I might at least lose my job, or maybe I have people that can talk cartel angry with me, or lose my relationship with my family, or whatever. And so, Whenever you're aware of wrongdoing around you, whether you're directly involved or not, you can be in something that looks like a prisoner's dilemma. Other examples. Yeah. In a campaign, two people might benefit from running a clean, decent campaign, um, but one of them might benefit more from being the one that runs the dirty schemes. Excellent. Yes. Look back at this scenario. You might think, I can conduct a high-minded campaign talking about my goals for the country, my ideals. Or I can attack my mind. What should I do? Take the high road or take the low? You think, well, okay, um, suppose I don't know what my opponent's gonna do. Suppose they take the high road. Well, I could take the high road with them and have a noble campaign, but if I attack them, they're not attacking me back. Hey, I'm even better off. I have a good way to tell. So I've got an incentive then to actually take the low road. But suppose they're taking the low road. Well, if I take the high road and just get battered, I'm gonna lose terribly. I've got to then take the low road and fight back. So what happens? Both parties end up thinking about it that way, so both end up taking the low road. So the political campaign ends up being mostly insulting the road. And yet everybody would have been better off if we had stayed on the high road. Okay? That's a real life example that we we see played out at least every four years. <laughs> um, other examples. Yeah. I was gonna say ordering appetizers at a restaurant. Like, so oh, if yes. like both people like decide to order appetizers, then everybody gets a share of everything. But usually, if only one person orders appetizers, then he has to split it all among everybody. Or at the end of the day, no one gets appetizers because no one wants to share or don't think anyone else will contribute. Okay, good. Yeah, ordering at a restaurant in general can be like this. And ordering appetizers, that's a really interesting example. Because you might think, okay, I, I would like to have an appetizer. But now, how are the incentives going to go? You think, ooh, they have chicken wings. And it's happy hour special. Only five dollars. I want some of those. <clears throat> but then you think, well, wait a minute. What if I order that? Right? What are other people going to do? I don't know if they're going to order appetizers or not. If they do and I don't, I don't have to pay any money. <laughs> but I get to eat some of their appetizers. <laughs> That's, that's awesome. <laughs> okay, so my best case scenario is I convince you to order the wings, but then I eat some. But then I think, well, okay, so I've got an incentive not to do it. I should try to get you to do it. But then that person thinks about it the same way and thinks, okay, yeah, um, so it can happen that neither one of us orders them, even though we both would like them. Or here's another scenario we're both on a diet, and now the appetizer becomes this temptation point. And I think, Oh, I'd rather that nobody ordered that. But I don't know if you're going to order one or not. If you 
do, I'm going to succumb to temptation. And you're going to get that thing I don't really like anyway. So I've got an incentive program the appetizer I like. Uh, and then we both blow our diets, making way too many calories. Or here's the way this actually plays out a lot of times. <clears throat> you go out with a group of people, let's say at work, and you just agree you're going to split the cost. Immensely dangerous. Okay. <laughs> Immensely dangerous. In fact, this, this is called Barnett's Lunch Law. <laughs> you're going to end up paying way more than if you weren't splitting the bill at the end. Why? Because you think, oh, well, I could get the tacos, or I could get the steak covered in onions, mushrooms, and cheese. That's a lot more expensive. If it were just me paying the bill, I don't know the tacos. But wait, this cheesy steak thing, I mean, that sounds really good. And I'm not going to pay twice that amount of money. I'm just going to pay twice that, you know, divided by N if there are N people at the table. So actually, the marginal cost increase for me of ordering the fancier dish is small. But everybody thinks of it that way. Everybody thinks, oh, well, since we're all sharing the cost, I can order more. And so everybody does. Um, um, one time, uh, worst of all, it was the APA in St. Louis. We all went out to this Italian restaurant. And the person who had recommended it just said, oh, listen, um, just have the chef bring us Whatever he wants to impress us, we're split. <laughs> oh God! Yeah, we didn't have money for a taxi to get back to the hotel. We fit seven philosophers into one person's VWB. <laughs> but here's the point of this: so whatever the cost is spread over a large number of people, um, that means each person has an incentive to add to the cost. Think about government itself as being this kind of thing, right? You want some particular program that benefits you from the government. How much extra do you have to pay as a result of that program? It's hardly any, because it's spread over hundreds of millions of people. And so you might think of the government as a big case of <laughs> a prisoner's dilemma, where everybody thinks, I'll be better off with this, and I won't have to pay much. The cost isn't going to fall on me primarily. And so everybody adds on their favorite program, their favorite thing, and the thing grows and grows. What happens in the real world? World. Suppose we actually try to study, is this behavior in the way people act? Or is this just some sort of normative ideal of how we they would act if they thought play by the strategy? People have done start surveys like this. They surveyed college students and they found that if the students don't know each other, then only 37 choose to cooperate. A majority, almost two-thirds, college students defect and in effect confess <laughs> in this scenario. If you talk to actual prisoners in jails, 56% opt to cooperate. So a majority end up staying silent. <laughs> They've learned the hard way about prisoners to live as going to be. Um, only 13% of the students managed to get the best out. That is to say, um, sometimes it worked out that they both ran up on each other. Sometimes it worked out that one stayed silent, the other ran up on the other. Um, only about one time in eight did the students actually managed to cooperate mutually. But the prisoners got that outcome about 30%. So that's it. it's sort of a mixed story. Not everybody gives in to the logic of the prisoners to them, but a lot do. And the less contact you've had with law enforcement, probably the more likely you are to actually get trapped in this thing. Now, how do you encourage cooperation, try to stop people from falling into the scenario? We've already seen one way, right? Penalize people for defending. And another way, offer a reward for their cooperating. Try to change those payoffs in such a way that cooperation looks better and defection looks worse. And so there's both the carrot and the stick, that the money waiting for you when you get out, but also the fact that you're going to be beat up savagely when you get out of here. Confess. Now, what are some other ways you can deal with this? Yeah. By, by cooperation, do you mean like cooperating with the other person or cooperating with the authorities? Well, here I mean, yeah, it's unfortunate the way the terminology goes. It's cooperating with the other person. Okay. Yeah. So cooperating here would mean cooperating with the other prisoner and not ratting him out, not snitching. Yeah. Uh, guilt, I guess. You can like guilt them into cooperation. Be like, hey, like, I'm married to your sister. She'd be real sad if I go to prison. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, guilt. 
That's a, yeah, you know, I, I married your sister. <laughs> She'll be real sad if you go to prison. I thought I go to prison. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that sort of thing, inducing guilt. If you think about how society in general tries to do this, um, society really isn't, despite Foucault, uh, a criminal gang or prison in this respect. However, we do have mechanisms like guilt to try to actually keep people in line. Why don't you actually shoplift, for example, when you realize there's nobody around, there's no camera, I could get away with this. Why don't you cheat on a test when you realize that person sitting over there isn't guarding their answers, I can see very clearly that paper if I want to. Um, why don't you? Like fear? But it might be just, it might be just fear of, you know, oh, if I'm wrong, what if I get caught? But, yeah, okay. they're not the cop. It's not, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you might, you never know, right, who's watching you. Uh, the Panopticon is Jeremy Bentham's idea for a prison where everybody sees everybody else. Um, and I guess something like that is actually being implemented in China. <laughs> Thanks to Google and uh, so on, where they're gonna, you're going to have a social index score, and every move you make, every step you take will be tracked by the government and They'll know exactly where you've been and what you're doing and what you've posted on social media and give you social points, you know? It's like, <laughs> you laughed at our surveillance state. Negative points for you, right? <laughs> you're not going to be allowed on the airplane next time. I'm just going to say. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Have you ever played The Sims before? Yeah. The Sims? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, 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 it's a bit like The Sims is going to be enacted with a billion real-world subjects. Um, but that sort of thing can worry you. But of course, you might also think, as Freud did, that guilt is society's <coughs> of doing this without anybody watching. If society sort of thinking, can't be watching you all the time, but I know what I'll do. I'll put a little representative of mine in your head, so that any time you're tempted, it will say, bad, don't do it. And so you might think of guilt as such a mechanism. What other ways do we have of encouraging cooperation and discouraging defection? Yeah, uh, wider political or cultural ideologies that uh, convince you of some greater meaning to cooperate. Ah, okay, good. Now, when Rubenstein says, look, this is really just making the obvious point that everybody's acting selfishly can be bad for the group, um, that's not exactly capturing the full content of this, as I mentioned. But on the other hand, it captures a lot. A lot of the real world cases are ones where you might say, yeah, we get into this because you're thinking I'm better off. Even if that other person suffers and has to pay a cost. Even if we're all somewhat worse off. Even if sort of imperceptibly do my own case. Now, in those scenarios, you could think, well, look, what I have to do is convince you of some larger ideology. I have to convince, I have to get you to look at the big picture. And to say, but wait, what happens if we all just walk across the grass? It's going to be muddy, it's going to be gross, we'll all regret having done it. So let's just try to have an ideology where we understand from the beginning that that's bad behavior. Okay? And then maybe we enact social norms to try to enforce that, but maybe the whole idea is just to try to make you see enough of the big picture to see, wait a minute, my action is part of this larger thing. I might think that it's isolated and that it has no significance cost to anyone else, um, but actually it really does. And so in short, to try to focus people on the big picture, I think is an important way of doing this. Realize you're not the only agent in society. If you were, if you were the only person who was going to do this, maybe yeah, it would be fun, but you're not. And so it's very important to look at the bigger picture and see what that behavior means in the larger context. Are there other ways? Yeah. I think like another way to change the matrix is by adding like more choices. Like you can talk and confess, but make yourself sound crazy or something like that. Ah, uh, add other choices. Remember when we were thinking about the example that Constant gave Kant about the murderer at the door? Um, it's common for people to say, "I'll just slam the door in his face," or I "Pretend not to speak the language," or "Feign a heart attack," or whatever it is, right? And similarly here, you can say, "What if there's another option?" So we can think, what if you can just somehow operate? What if you could stay silent or confess or in some way just abstain? Act crazy. Pretend you don't speak the language. Act like you're deaf. <laughs> Whatever it is, try to, you know, 
play dumb with the police or something like that. Then what would happen? You can actually write out the table, I think, of what that would look like. And it would look something like this. And does it help us to sort of go with that third option? What if there's a third choice? Well, this part of the table is going to look just the same. Um, I mean, in general pattern, except we've now got this third option. What happens if one person abstains and just plays dumb? Well, you might say the whole thing doesn't work. And so let's just assume that's kind of a mid-level scenario for everybody. It's just some third neutral choice. Well, then we can analyze what would happen. And from A's point of view, you might say, well, I don't care if the other person's abstaining. Actually, I, I grew up not that way. I'm not sure. Let's assume that the police just get frustrated and try another strategy. Then. That's why it's just neutral. It's like, that's a draw. Nothing happens. But otherwise, yeah, I get my first choice here if I defend. Here, actually, my best choice is abstaining. So now, actually, it tells me, well, defend or abstain, but it no longer tells me that I have a dominant strategy. Now, I'm actually better off, if you're defecting, I'm better off just playing dumb. Maybe that also defecting? Actually, it depends what this third option is. This is plausible for certain options and not very plausible for others. But if it were like this, the other person would think of it the same way. And so actually, the neat, that equilibrium would be in favor of abstaining. We wouldn't get the good outcome, we'd just get some third neutral outcome. Now, maybe on the other hand, depending on what that third option is, maybe if we act like we don't speak the language, then actually the other person has a tremendous advantage if we just go to jail for the maximum anyway. So in a real world case, this might not be the third choice at all. Maybe that's the worst case scenario. Um, if, I mean, suppose you do just slam the door in the murderer's face, go back to Kant's example. How does that work out for you? Here I'm assuming, oh, well, fairly well. Or maybe it just defers it to the guy knocks again. But what if he now breaks the door down and kills you? <laughs> it's not your third option. So I, I thought it was clever when I threw all that out. Now it's <laughs> fairly stupid. We are going to contrast these prisoners' bullets with two other cases that are kind of similar. One is called a stag hunt scenario. How is it different? Well, in this situation, if you cooperate and the other person doesn't, you can get hurt, right? Cooperation has the potential to harm you. In a stag hunt scenario, if you cooperate and the other person doesn't, you don't really get hurt. You just don't get a benefit, okay? So then your cooperation is fruitless, but it doesn't harm you anymore. In a, what is known as a prisoner's delight, you get rewarded for cooperating no matter what the other person does. And so, from an institutional point of view, once we see the distinctions, we're going to think, what can we do to turn prisoner's dilemmas in our organization into stag hunts, and stag hunts into prisoner's delights, so that each person does what they're naturally going to do, and the result is beauty and cooperation and excellence for all, instead of people going to jail for a long time. So anyway, that's what's coming up on the 